gold has been up every single year in December, mm. as has silver in the calendar month of December. Average of the last six years is 3.7%. So I don't know. Let's say we finish the month, hopefully uh, above 2000 spot, and you get an average December. I can see where we're going to break out next year based on all these other extenuating circumstances, but then also then rally. I mean, I think we could easily see a $3,000 gold price in the next couple of years. Silver on the has average, as you might expect, about double that over the last six Decembers. So now we're talking, let's just say, what's the easiest math? 8% up off of 25, $27 at the end of of uh, December, if it just plays out that way. In a recent analysis by Craig Hemke, the editor and publisher of the TF Metals Report, concerns over a lack of confidence and education in the financial system were highlighted. Hemke speculates that gold's upward trajectory could be even more substantial if every investor opted to take delivery of just one ounce. Hemke predicts gold will surpass $2,000 by December, anticipating a breakout next year and a rally towards $3,000 in the coming years. Silver is expected to see an 8% increase from its base of $25 to $27 by December. Despite gold's recent gains, the precious metal faced a setback during the first week of December trading. After achieving a historic monthly close above $2,000 and opening Monday's Asian trading session with a new all-time high of $2,150 per ounce, gold encountered a steady decline, ultimately hovering around the $2,000 level by the end of the week. In contrast, silver saw a 2.5% rally in the same week, marking the second consecutive week of profit. Hemke notes a shift in banks' perception of higher gold prices. Traditionally a signal of fiat currency confidence, banks now see it as advantageous, responding to currency devaluation. The well-established trend of gold rising during a weakening dollar is considered a protective measure for central banks amid market volatility. Hemke parallels the significant moves observed in the gold market 2019, where the precious metal achieved record highs in various currencies, including the British pound, Japanese yen, Canadian, and Australian dollars. As outlined by Hemke, these historical trends contribute to the anticipation of a potential surge in gold prices, particularly if the dollar undergoes a similar trajectory. Before diving into Craig Hemke's insightful interview, subscribe to our channel and give this video a big thumbs up. Uh, people, you know, that have known you and I for years and watch you and I talk about this stuff for years, they know how this system works and they know that there's always been an incentive for the banks, the bullion banks, but you know, also the Fed and the Treasury, they keep the price of gold in check, right? As a reflection of confidence in fiat currency and that inflation is down and all this kind of stuff. That that is demonstrable. I mean, I think you can notice that that has changed. You know, all the stuff that we've already talked about is evidence of this. That the banks could really use, and the central banks could really use a higher gold price. You know, if they want to revalue the gold they hold on their balance sheet, or if it's all the way just down to, you know, in the West, uh, we like to buy it when it when it goes up, you know, and not when it goes down. As it goes up, the other in the East will relax their gold buying demand a little bit, perhaps. And so maybe a higher gold price will help the banks keep the, you know, keep the whole thing scheme going a little bit longer because at this depressed price, the thing is obviously speeding, you know, to a rather nasty conclusion for them. So there's incentive now to have a higher gold price, to gradually allow it, not, you know, maybe not to reset it at whatever level, but to at least gradually let it go up. And that's how you can look at it from just a regular investor and go, I can see where we're going to break out next year based on all these other extenuating circumstances, but then also then rally. I mean, I do think we could easily see a $3,000 gold price in the next couple of years. And when you extrapolate that out to what that would be to the mining shares or what it would just mean to a regular investor, you know, to have whatever your savings, instead of pricing them in fiat currency that's being devalued, save in gold. And actually see your purchasing power and your savings increase. That's one of the beautiful things about Kinesis. You know, you talk about buying a gram of gold. Oh yeah, God, those little those little wafers, man, they're like like that big, you know, and it could easily just get lost. But if you go on the Kinesis platform, you can set yourself up to buy fractions of a gram every two weeks when you get a paycheck. And now, rather than having your hard work and your savings be held in 
pounds or euro or dollars or yen or whatever, all this mm. fiat money that's just being devalued to nothing, you're holding your savings and actual sound money that the value of that's actually going up. And you're doing your part to, to help to drain the system of its physical metal and get it out of the banker's hands. So anyway, a long answer. And like I said, I wanted to, I, here I said, we should talk about this, Andy, and I'm doing all the talking. Um, but there, we, we are at this point where um, there is value now. It's, it's opposite of the way it always has been. There's value in a higher gold price within the financial system. And, and that's something that, you know, we've not really experienced before. And that may be what lies in store, you know, just especially even just in the next year. The last time we saw that was 2019, mm -hmm. where gold was making new all-time highs in every other major currency. And we were like, well, it'll be the dollar's turn soon enough. And it was, you know, it's, it's like if you, anybody can pull up uh, a chart of the dollar index, and go all the way back 40 frigging years. And you can see it just does this, right? It goes down to 80, it goes up to 120, and it just goes sideways. Mm -hmm. While at the same time, you go back 20 years, gold's gone from 200 some odd dollars to $2,000. Okay, because those all of those currencies that make up the dollar index are slowly being devalued. Hemke identifies critical levels in the silver market, particularly highlighting 25, 26, and $28. These levels are seen as pivotal, with potential buy stops and breaking through considered significant for market dynamics. Currently, the price of silver hovers around a key support level of $23.70. As long as the price remains above this level, the bullish outlook for the day is maintained, with the following main target at $24.60. However, a break below $23.70 would halt the anticipated rise, potentially leading to a shift in sentiment and a decline. The historical backdrop includes the infamous Silver Thursday on March 27, 1980, when three brothers attempted to corner the silver market. Over a calendar year, silver's price skyrocketed by 713% to nearly $50 per ounce at its peak. Hemke draws parallels between this historical event and the surge in silver prices in April 2011, where it jumped from $18 to $48 in just eight months. The rally, driven by speculators lured by momentum and favorable charts, was doomed due to a commercial short squeeze, notably by J.P. Morgan, which had short positions without the physical metal. Hemke underscores the importance of this historical context, emphasizing the speed at which silver prices can escalate. Let's get back to the interview. Silver went to $48 in April of 2011. Mm -hmm. It began that run from 18 yeah. about eight months earlier. What's going on there? Well, you had this mad rush of speculators coming in, uh, you know, because of things building on momentum and the chart looks great and all this kind of stuff. Back then, too, and what ultimately caused the demise of that rally, you had a commercial squeeze. JP Morgan was short and they just kept getting short without the physical metal. And you had the, that last little rally in April from 38 to 48 was all a commercial short squeeze. All right. I only bring that up just to let people know there's history and precedent of how quickly this can go. So when you say 35, sure, of course. Uh, but when silver has caught fire in the past, it has generally exceeded that. And so we sit now here on this cusp of a breakout in silver too. I, I should Here's a stat for you, Andy. I picked up a couple of days ago. Somebody tweeted out a chart. Last six years, gold has been up every single year in December. Mm. as has silver in the calendar month of December. Average of the last six years is 3.7%. So I don't know. Let's say we finish the month, hopefully uh, above 2000 spot, and you get an average December. We're looking at 2080, which means the February contract will be 2100, the February futures contract. And at 2100, you've got yourself a clear breakout. Silver on the has average, as you might expect, about double that over the last six Decembers. So now we're talking, let's just say, what's the easiest math? 8% up off of 25, $27 at the end of, of uh, December, if it just plays out that way. The key, you mentioned $25 key level. 26 is a key level because we've been up there a couple of times and yeah. gone back down to some uh, buy stops that are run above that level, some of these hedge fund yeah. buy stops. And then above 28 because that's the top of the range. 
since uh, 2000. All of a sudden you're 29, then you get a three handle and then it starts accelerating on itself. You talk about the hedge funds that are still short. Think what people need to consider is the process when you flip from being short and constantly selling the rally to now being long and buying the dip, you got one buy to cover your short. You got a second buy to now go long. Mm. So that's that's 2x normal buying pressure and interest. And you look at like one last part of this, total open interest in COMEX silver is like 130,000 contracts. Routinely, even as recently as a couple of years ago, it was north of 200,000. Mm. Even if you go back to 2011, it was 160, 170, 180,000 contracts. Think of that as all brand new speculator buying interest that piles in. And the final component of that, what if the banks don't aggressively short this next time? If they recognize, wait, hold on a second. We don't, we don't want to risk losing this metal hoard we've developed over the years. We don't want to take the risk of the system collapsing. So putting that all back together, Andy, that's why I wanted to ask you about silver. Because, yeah, who knows? Maybe it'll just continue to go sideways and drive us all bananas. But the history is there that when you do get a breakout, that everybody piles in and it's a little tiny market and you get all this buying interest, even of the futures contracts. And all of a sudden the thing takes on a life of its own. Um, that's certainly a possibility again. And uh, people need to be pondering and considering that as the new year begins. Craig Hemke's analysis provides valuable insights into the dynamics of the gold and silver markets, highlighting potential trends and historical parallels. Considering the implications of a shifting perception in banks, and the potential for gold and silver to surge, how might investors navigate these market conditions to capitalize on potential opportunities or protect their assets amid the evolving economic landscape? Share your thoughts in the comments below. If you liked the video, please subscribe to our channel and remember to activate notifications by hitting the bell icon. Your participation means a lot to us. Thank you.